Good morning, students, um, on this um, Friday, 11th of November 2016. This is the sixth and uh, penultimate lecture uh, of seven on biodiversity and biotechnology. Today, in today's class, we will start the uh, first of two lectures on, um, on biomass conversion steps within a biorefinery. So we talked about uh, Again, what is biomass? Uh, what are, is the composition of biomass? What's inside biomass? What are the differences between species, um, not only, for example, grass versus um, beans, but within uh, a plant type, excuse me. <coughs> so what is the um, uh, differences in biodiversity, for example, between a waxy potato and a starchy potato, a non-waxy potato. Um, in today's class, oh, we, then before, after that, we talked about pretreatment steps, um, a very important step of the biorefinery process to get your biomass in a certain situation. So the breaking down of lignin, the breaking down of cellulose, hemicellulose, um, the extraction of proteins, um, Etc. We talked about that yesterday and the day before that, I think, a little bit. And today we will finish uh, this uh, biorefinery course on the last and, and possibly um, most important part, the conversion step within a biorefinery. Okay, so here you have the biomass that you've, uh, that you've defined and you've uh, selected what you want, so either the oils or the proteins or the amino acids, etc. You can either thermochemically transform or biochemically transform this um, biomass into chemicals, biofuels, and materials. Our learning outcomes um, for both 6 and 7 are to know the different definition and aims of conversions in biorefineries, know the classifications of catalysts, there are different types of catalysts, identify conversions and catalysts used within biorefineries. So here we go back to the um, to what we talked about. We, we have the feedstock, the conversion, either physical, chemical, physiochemical, etc., into a, um, a, a, a required feedstock. Now we're going to zoom in on the conversion and a little bit of the uh, separation post-treatment into a final product. Industrial reactors. So there are lots of different types of industrial reactors. I mentioned yesterday about um, different types. We have uh, batch reactors, we have uh, steady state reactors. And now I'm going to tell you how, what the difference is between a batch reactor and a uh, steady state reactor. So a reactor is any kind of um, any kind of closed system, uh, well, it's not completely closed. It has one input and one output, but it's a it's a system which has a, a contacting pattern and kinetics. That just means that there that you have more than one thing interacting to each other, and uh, it and something happens. They react, and it can either happen slowly or quickly. And the kinetics of the system is how things react. Sometimes you don't want it to fully react or you want to slow it down uh, just to get a certain fraction. A batch reactor is a, a uniform composition everywhere in the reactor, but of course the composition changes with time. Yeah, there are people dropping out. Let me pause. All right, back to... Um, the presentation. Everybody's back now. The b a batch reactor, it means you are doing everything at once. So imagine you have a mixer at home. I mean, I like to bake. That's now you know a little bit more about me. So I use a lot of analogies for baking. But if you're going to bake cookies, right, you have a bowl uh, and you add the, the eggs and you add the flour and you add um, uh, milk or whatever. And then you mix it together. That is a batch, um, a batch reactor. So you're doing things in batches. So we, we talk about having a batch of cookie dough. 
Um, the uh, t uh, against that, the alternative to um, a batch reactor is a steady state flow reactor. So a steady state flow reactor can either be a a plug flow, where you have uh, just a pipe, basically. It doesn't have to be a pipe. Um, but uh, before, well, let me finish before I give you other examples. So you have a pipe, and as the pipe goes along, a reaction is occurring. And at the beginning, the reaction is starting, and at the end, the reaction is completed. And you can do a lot of things within the pipe uh, to make the reaction go faster or slower, or you can add solvents, etc. You could have a pipe flowing into the, this pipe. But anyway, it's, it's a steady state, so there's no time at which you stop the reactor. The reactor runs 24 hours a day. Well, maybe not 24 hours a day, uh, maybe. But it, it goes on and on and on and on and on. There's no um, rea uh, limit, let's say. You have a flow, so you all know about flow, yeah? Another example of a plug flow system would be a be an algae farm. I'm not sure if you ever um, any of you got has have, have had a, had the opportunity to see an algae farm, but a lot of them are open air um, like canals, right? So they're like um, pools that go snake back and forth and back and forth, and has a very slow flow. So um, at the beginning, the water doesn't have a lot of algae in it. But as the water flows through the uh, the algae farm, it grows, and that is another. And at the end, the algae is uh, is uh, filtered out. That's another example of a uh, steady state system. Um, steady state systems in general um, uh, work quite well, but not always possible technically. A mixed flow system. Uh, I'm you all of you have seen seen this if I believe oh well, not all of you maybe there are a few people who have who are just here for a, a few months um, but a fixed flow system an example of that is a is a um, is a, uh, a wastewater treatment facility quite often so wastewater will come in it'll be put into a settling tank and then uh, the water at the top or at, at the and at the end has been settled so that it can go out. And this is not only for uh, sanitation water, but for lots of systems. You have one coming in, it'll be mixed, and you have on the other side uh, the outflow. But at no time does this system stop. The residence time of city flow systems is dependent on how much goes in and how much goes out. For a review of steady state systems, you'd have to go back to um, not too f too long ago. The first class that you guys got at the beginning of this uh, semester actually was on environmental um, geography, and we talked about steady state systems. Remember that? It was at least two months ago, so <laughs> maybe it didn't. Um, maybe you remember that. All right, so, oh, I should go back. Remember, output is a function of the input, the kinetics, and the amount of contacting. So how much is, for example, being mixed. Types of chemical reactions. You have um, four basic types of uh, chemical reactions. You have on the one side uh, homogeneous or heterogeneous, and on the other side you have non-catalytic and catalytic chemical reactions. A homogeneous non-catalytic reaction example is a uh, most gas phase reactions. Yeah, so if something's happening in the gas phase, we have three basic phases of matter, right? You have liquid, solid. And gas. So most gas phase reactions are non-catalytic and homogeneous. Non-catalytic obviously because it's difficult to aspirate a catalyst. Catalysts tend to be denser than air so they will they will drop out and if it's uh, denser than air and they're solid then uh, the reaction with 
between a, a gas and a solid is um, is very slow to be <laughs> to to say the least. A heterogeneous non-catalytic is a lot of burning, especially so burning of coil, coil of coal, a roasting of ores. Those are non-catalytic. Attack of solids by acids, so any kind of acid hydrolysis uh, is non-catalytic. A gas liquid absorption, absorption with a reaction, and the reduction of iron ore ore to iron in steel. Somewhat in between homogeneous and heterogeneous are very fast reactions such as burning of a flame. Um, it's a mostly gas phase, but uh, quite often, uh, if you, if you if you burn a flame, you may be consuming paper, right? So it's not completely homogeneous. Um, if you want to go back to how fire works, remember that there's say the the fire triangle. You need um, oxygen, you need heat, and you need fuel. Those are the three parts of um, of uh, uh, of a flame, of a fire. Most liquid phase reactions are catalytic and homogeneous. So if it's a liquid-liquid phase, quite often it's, it will be catalytic. The uh, catal uh, catalysis uh, can be include um, enzymes, but also uh, metals. I would actually say metals are most often used uh, in catalysis. Uh, a heterogeneous catalytic is, uh, for example, ammonia synthesis the oxidation of ammonia to produce nitric, nitric acid, the cracking of crude oil, if you didn't know that. Cracking, what does cracking mean? Cracking is the um, industrial jargon, the industrial word used for uh, the, um, the production of products from uh, diesel, petroleum. So uh, they at very high, high temperatures and high, high pressure, um, they use catalysts and they crack the uh, oil into whatever they want, and that depends on what they want and it will will and how long they do it will produce different things. So it, it's a, a polymer. Basically, um, uh, all petroleum products are polymers of uh, petroleum. The oxygenation of SO2 to SO3 is also uh, a heterogeneous catalytic. In between, somewhat in between, are enzymes and micro, micro, microbial reactions. Excuse me for that. Why is that in between homogeneous and heterogeneous? Well, uh, an enzyme is, uh, is, is something. So if you put an enzyme in a reaction, it's not completely heterogeneous because you've, you've, uh, you've added an enzyme. But enzymes are so small, they're basically just a couple of amino acids uh, uh, linked to each other. And microbes are so small, normally they're, they're an insignificant part of the reaction. However, this is not always the case, especially for microbes and wastewater treatment. They're a, a, a the sludge, which is mostly the, the microbes, um, are significant. So somewhere in between homogeneous and heterogeneous, catalytic uh, for um, enzyme and microbial reactions. Same could be said for the colloidal systems. Some colloidal systems have just very tiny particles that um, uh, are so small, sometimes they're ignored. Gasification. So uh, gasification is uh, something that we, uh, I think there are two or three, one of them gonna go through gasification, uh, Fischer tropes, and uh, pyrolysis, gasification is the first. The aim of gasification is to produce gas for the synthesis of fuels or other prod products. So this is high energy density, flexible storage and transport, and less emissions, right? So you're going to produce gas for fuel. Also, electricity is produced at higher efficiency as compared to burning with direct burning of biomass. Yeah, so you get a cleaner, uh, higher efficiency uh, energy from gasification. In gasification, you put a, a biomass, and um, well, to be honest, just about any biomass will do. Um, 
you might want to separate the proteins first because that's uh, worth some money. But you could put the biomass into a, a feeding fuel, into a large tube um, filled with air, and you um, and you burn it. It produces a gas, and in the tube, the um, the ash is separated. The remaining problems is tar removal. So tar uh, is uh, is a substance that will build up on the insides of all of the chambers. So you, even though this could be considered a uh, a steady state reactor, you still need to take it offline a significant amount of time to clean it. There are ways around getting around this, of course. So it's, uh, if you design a system, you can put two gasification columns, and you just you know switch them back and forth so that you're cleaning one while you're using the other, and then vice versa. Or you have a, a whole array of these. So you can get around it, but it, that's, the, that's a problem. Corrosion uh, is a problem, so you have to replace them uh, quite often. And you have to optimize it for varying biomass composition. You can't just throw anything in, like a banana peel or a, a last night's pizza crusts, and expect it to work the same. It will be different. Gasification, its comp composition depends on temperature and on the use of a catalyst. So there are two main types of gasification. You have one, which is low temperature. And for us, low temperature is between 800 there are being, people being kicked. I'm going to pause again. The problem with uh, tar is that, um, no, tar is not a good thing. Tar, um, uh, just like in your lungs, if, you're, if you smoke, it's, it clings to the um, inside of the pipes and the um, reactor. So tar, you have, to, you have to shut down the process to clean um, the reactor from tar. So that's a, a bad thing. Let's see. All right, um, people are coming back. So I'm just going to continue on this sheet. Gas composition depends on temperature on use of... Ca oh. Well, yeah, tar removal is, um, is, is a bad con consequence. I mean, no, no, no. Oh, I no. The the thing is, you have to remove the tar. Uh, so that's the challenge. It remove it from being clung to the inside of the. Got it. Good. <laughs> that's the challenge. It gets inside the column, and you have to get it out. So you have to remove the tar from the column. Yeah. Tar is, um, yeah, I, I won't go into what tar is. It's uh, in, it's not significant for, especially not for your project. Uh, you're not doing any kind of gasification. If I mean, a lot of these things we do here at, uh, at Advanced University and also at Wageningen. Um, so it's good to know about gasification, et cetera, pyrolysis. Um, but it's not something that you'll be using specifically in your project. Unless you want to define, de design uh, pyrolysis as part of your biorefinery, which is very possible. So it's up to you. I'll go back. Um, so the two main types of gasification, as I mentioned, you have low, uh, low temperature. And low temperature is still you know, much higher than what we are used to. So it's between 800 and 1,000 degrees Celsius. It will produce uh, gases such as, as a mixture of gases of carbon monoxide, uh, hydrogen gas, methane, but also a plethora of uh, CXHY, so that means any kind of hydrocarbon, right? So at low temperatures, you get a large heterogeneous mixture of gases at low temperature. So what that means is that you still have a product which is, uh, which is uh, good for syngas or electricity. But it's um, not a very uh, high quality, so you still need to crack it, or in other words, reform it, uh, these um, random hydrocarbons, into carbon dioxide or H2, 
which is called bio syngas, which you can put into diesel, methanol, ammonia, hydrogen, chemical industry, electricity. Yeah. So the, the good thing is it's low temperature. It's only 800 to 1,000 degrees Celsius. But on the bad side, um, it, it's a mixture of hydrocarbons. And the higher temperature gasification uh, has more applications, but you'll use a lot more energy. You have to get something up to 1,200 to 1,400 degrees Celsius. That's a very high temperature uh, indeed. Pyrolysis Okay, I have, I have two very good questions. The first is from Leonard. A uh, gasification is an anaerobic process. Correct. How can you get hydrocarbons? Don't they get oxidized? Um, actually, what you're doing is re you're removing the oxygen, right? So if you, what burns uh, is is the oxygen. That's why it has to be at such a high high temperature. Well, it doesn't really burn per se. You're just you're getting the oxygen out. So you're getting an, an, a, C, a CX, just like, like a sugar, right? So C6H2O6, glucose, and you're removing the oxygen. So you, you, aren't, uh, you are not oxidizing it, you're actually reducing, well, not really reducing it, you're just getting rid of the oxygen. And that gets then, um, let's say, burned off. But it's at such high pressure Normally, we're, we're used to things burning at uh, room temperature, at 25, 20 degrees Celsius, right? Or if it's in a cool, if you're out uh, on a cold uh, winter night with a fire, then of course it's cooler. But we're, we're, we're used to normal temperatures between 10 and 25 degrees Celsius. But we're talking about 1100 degrees Celsius. So at such high pressures, it remains, uh, it can remains a, a, a gas or even turn into a liquid and not a solid. The second question, I hope I, I, that was an answer. Uh, good. Yannick, what is more efficient, low cracking or high? It, that is a very good question, and it depends. It's, uh, I'll go back. If you aren't bothered, if you just want SNG, then, of course, low temperature is more efficient. But... If you are going for uh, methanol or uh, diesel or, you know, uh, a good question. And I, I, I wish I could tell you right now what it is. Uh, not my specialty. So let's uh, look it up. There you go. Um, synthetic natural gas. So it is a type of... Uh, methane. Natural gas is also known as methane. So you can burn it. But that isn't um, necessarily the highest usage. Maybe um, methanol, it's easier to transport, certainly, than uh, a natural gas. You don't have to have such high pressures. So the, to answer your question, Yannick, the efficiency depends on what your uh, end product is. These are probably worth a lot more money. I'm not an expert, but I can imagine. My expertise is on proteins and amino acids. Um, or uh, less uh, has less revenue generation for, for uh, uh, synthetic natural gas. Okay. Next slide. Pyrolysis. So this is the, uh, the second one. It's thermal cracking of biogas. We have a, a, uh, a pyrolysis uh, machine in the lab building. So uh, when we are there, I might take groups of people to um, take a look at it. Um, there are not a lot of people uh, doing pyrolysis. We're pretty unique in that, in, that, in that matter. So pyrolysis is the thermal cracking of biomass. I mentioned that term before. Its advantages is it's comparable with the gasification but even higher energy content in the gas. So there's no O2 supplied to the, yeah. Cracking is an industrial jargon, industrial word for the um, conversion of biomass. Uh, it, or actually we use that word not just for biomass, but also um, 
petroleum for diesel. So if you produce plastic from um, from diesel, from uh, petroleum, you put it in a reactor. And if you go to a, um, an, a factory, when I say reactor, I mean huge, the size of uh, skyscrapers, basically. The size of my apartment building is how big they are. And um, uh, they are at a very high pressure and at very high temperature. They uh, polymerize uh, any molecule, including um, including diesel. So polymers, remember, are you take two molecules and you fuse them together in a chain. So uh, uh, remember, cellulose is a polymer of glucose. And you can polymerize um, uh, biomolecules just as well as as, as such as amino acids, just as well as um, diesel. So this cracking is this method of high pressure, um, high temperature in a reaction chamber. Sometimes it's 10 liters, sometimes it's yes. And they call it cracking. Um, I don't know why they call it cracking. I'm sure if you Google it, there'll be a Wikipedia about the history of the word cracking, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you. The advantage is it's, it's very similar to um, uh, uh, gasification, however, at a very um, lower, a much lower um, temperature, and there's no oxygen supplied to reactor. It has the same problems, however. So if you have a biomass, so you're at higher pressure, but you're at 400 to 800, and there's no O2, uh, you get a char. Most people see this char as uh, waste, but char actually can also be used. Um, you supply a, the heat. The vapors are condensed into a liquid, which then uh, you can use for power generation. And the gases uh, are also out. And these gases, it's, se it's self-fulfilling, so you can use the gases, burn the gases, to produce the heat of pyrolysis. And that's um, not uh, as possible w with gasification. So if we look, well, what's the difference between uh, gasification and pyrolysis? And of course, we also have normal combustion. So let's compare normal combustion is what, in the Netherlands anyway, we do with approximately 100% of our uh, trash, which is not uh, given to recycling. Of this, by far the most, 95% is heat. And you have a little bit of char uh, or charcoal uh, left over. So it's 96%, uh, so it's very high percent heat and 4% uh, uh, heat and very low combustion. Uh, that's why I said except for, <laughs> I'm, uh, you must have missed that. Yeah, so except for the trash that is recycled, um, everything else is um, burned which is quite good. I would rather have um, the trash being burned and heat, heat being produced for energy than it being buried, like in most, many, if not all, most part of the world. So it's not a bad thing. Um, compared to it, gasification produces a lot less heat, produces a lot of gas, very little tar, and uh, or pyrolysis oil, and charcoal. Here you get this oil and this charcoal and a much less heat. Fischer-Tropsch synthesis. Fischer-Tropsch synthesis is a catalytic reaction in which uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen gas react to form hydrocarbons. A typical process conditions are between 200 and 350 degrees Celsius, so it's much lower, and the pressure is only around 15 to 35 bars uh, only. Uh, but it's uh, compared to the previous steps there, it's actually quite low. Typical reaction products include uh, gasoline, so that's uh, C5 to C11, and this CXHY. Diesel is 9 to 25, and waxes, so above 19 uh, carbons. And this ratio is optimized depending on the reaction conditions. Um, there are uh, two reactions happening in the synthesis reaction of gasoline and diesel. So you use CO plus 2H2, produces a, a hydrocarbon plus water. And you also have 2CO plus H2, again, also producing a hydrocarbon plus um, CO2. 
the water gas shift reaction is CO plus water to CO2 plus H2. And as I mentioned, um, we use quite often metal catalysts. So um, either cobalt or iron. Uh, these uh, are, are actually cheap ones because they uh, we also use gold and platinum and palladium. And, and platinum is very, very expensive as, and gold's not the cheapest either. So uh, if possible, they use cobalt and iron. Cobalt produce, produces the first reaction. It has a higher reaction rate, higher reactivity time, and a longer, longer lifetime. So if you use cobalt, you're going to produce hydrocarbon and water. Iron promotes the second reaction with a small side reaction of the water gas shift. It has a higher pollution tolerance. That means um, it is less uh, uh, sensitive to a, anything that's polluting in it, it's inhibiting the reaction, and iron is a lot cheaper than uh, than cobalt or uh, platinum. So you use iron, you'll have uh, you'll still produce hydrocarbons, but you'll also produce a bit of um, CO2. Not a bit, a whole bunch of CO2, and that's not what you're going for. Yeah, you want the hydrocarbons. You want all of your carbon here going into hydrocarbon, right? That's the goal. You want the hydrocarbon. So if you're doing if you're doing the second reaction with iron, then you're produce your not all of your carbon is going into this hydrocarbon. It's going into CO2. So your inputs are being used up for something you don't want. But it's cheaper iron than uh, cobalt. Okay, that's the end of this lecture. Um, I'm going to uh, let you guys go and do the, the homeworks for assignment, assignment uh, 6, that is, for lecture 6. And I will be around for um, any questions.